Whoopsies. <laughs> Last minute adjustment of the camera there for YouTube. I do apologize. It was in the wrong position. There you go. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good night, wherever you are in the world. I have Saskia in the uh, in the Medical Ireland Library this evening. Hang on, I got to have to adjust that for a second. I, I do apologize. I was quite uh, late adjusting the uh, the webcam uh, for the YouTube viewers. Anyway, very good evening to you. This is Live Irish Myths, episode 71. Shachto is a hain. I'm Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. You're all very welcome along tonight. We are talking about Ireland's lost Stonehenge. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed the past four episodes in which we read Slowly but surely, the tale Togal Brunya da Derga, uh, the destruction of da Derga's hostel, uh, culminating in a bit of a disappointing end last night. But that's probably because the whole story is a spoiler <laughs> for the end. You're all welcome along anyway. It's lovely to see you all. Uh, before we start tonight, a couple of things to say. The first of all is that I'm very grateful to Karen Gogus, who's a regular watcher here on uh, Live Irish Myths. Karen and I are longtime friends. Uh, Karim is the one who is responsible for the 3D reconstruction of Ireland Stonehenge, which you would have seen in today's graphic uh, to advertise on the YouTube. Uh, it, it's there. Uh, you'll see that there's a map overlaid onto an image. Well, that image is a 3D image recreating what Ireland Stonehenge might have looked like. So we're very grateful to Karim. Uh, hopefully he's there and he's uh, I, 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 able to acknowledge the uh, credit. Uh, I also wanted to say... Last night, late on in the episode, I gave a warning about trolling behavior, <laughs> and it wasn't immediately clear, but a few people were a little bit upset or uh, worried that perhaps they had said something wrong. It was absolutely none of the regulars. Uh, it was none of you guys. Uh, I saw a comment which I construed to be somebody having a go at somebody else. Uh, it may not have been that, the case. Afterwards, I couldn't find said comment. So uh, the person whose name I hadn't recognized anyway removed it afterwards. And it's, it was just a reminder that this is a friendly group and we haven't had any issues with trolls. We haven't had a, any issues with people uh, getting into rows with other people. Uh, and I, I, I hope it will stay that way. This is episode 71. And I've never had to issue a warning. Uh, and so some of you, as I say, were a little bit perturbed last night. Nothing to be worried about. Uh, if you're not already familiar with the idea of Patreon patrons, uh, I want to thank all of the Mythical Ireland patrons over at patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash Mythical Ireland. Uh, you don't have to be a patron to enjoy the activities of Mythical Ireland, uh, but you may wish to go and have a look. Anyway, and if you do, I'm pasting the link in uh, as a comment. I've done so already on YouTube, and I'm just about to, if I can get to it, uh, on uh, Facebook. And lastly, last but not least, I want to say hello to Andrew Byrne in Australia. Andrew has corresponded with me regularly over the past while. And because he's in Australia, and because these episodes are at like 3 o'clock in the morning for him, He's unable to catch up live, but he watches the videos afterwards. So, Andrew, I wanted to say a special hello to you. And hopefully when you're watching this episode on the catch up later, uh, you'll get to hear your hello. And uh, I appreciate uh, your interest in all of the Mythical Ireland matters. And I've enjoyed our correspondence. I better do some of the announcements because it looks like the, there's a hell of a lot of people saying hello. Erica Bow is the first of the commenters on YouTube. Trunonawa from Hot. Cibolo in Texas. Well, it's nice. It was lovely and warm here. Very sunny, very warm today, but then it clouded over and it's due to do quite heavy rain tonight and it's getting stormy apparently. Batten down the hatches. Archaeoastronomy database is in also and I was asking him or her to remind us of their real name. I'm not sure if they did that. Uh, so hello to you. Daisy Peter says good afternoon. Um, it's amazing to be here. Well, it's lovely to have you here, Daisy. <laughs> Mandy McCurl says, hello, everyone. Hope you're all well. Still and st still and dull here tonight on the Isle of Mull. Okay. The midges are out tonight and the piper's out too. <laughs> nice to see you, Mandy, as always. Erica Rivertree says, Bannachty, oh, Louisville, Kentucky. Thought I'm sure. Boshti and you. Connorsa thought too. Tomigma. Agus Vish. Vion Greenig, Tatniv and you. Och. Thought on. Yeah. Thought on Reinig coming. 
Um Murdoch Machandrui says Jigwich Gach Dinna Akarja. August Tosafane Murdoch, pleasure to have you along. Dan B. Jesus, you just gave me a heart attack. I forgot I had this open. <laughs> hello, Dan. And sorry for giving you a scare. Ryan Hampton says, hello, thank you for this. From Long Island. Lovely to have you along, Ryan. Jigwich. Daisy Peters is saying, Falja Murdoch. Anyone else? Robin Edgar, who's a regular Mythical Ireland follower. I have, ha I have had some fun with trolls on the Irish Stones Megalithic Research Group, but they have not fared so well. <laughs> Wink. <laughs> uh, good stuff, Robin. I... I AGG AG -G says hi from Portugal. Found you through your awesome Megalithomania presentation, Anthony. Well, brilliant. And it's a great delight to have you along. Tough fall to row it. You are welcome. Saska S says Jigwich from the north of the Isle. Hello, Saska. Saka, sorry, Saka. Very nice to have you along. Jay McHugh, who I think is Joan, says Jigwich Ahanton August Antua Freshen O Ben Ether from Hoth, overlooking Dublin. And on Facebook, oh. Oh, this is going to take a while. Okay, I'm going to do this really quickly. Desiree Riley, hello. Barbara Barney, hello. Barbara, Heather Geron Rice is in the house. Hello, Heather. Rowan Grove is in Colorado, was out gardening this morning. Lovely stuff, Rowan. Nice to have you. Steve Martinson says, greetings, Anthony and the clan. Blessings to all. Banachty, Ort, uh, Steve. Scott Gracie says, howdy all. Hello, Scott. Margaret Ring is watching. Connors thought to Margaret. Uh, Ralph Waldron, Tronoloa. Dinner to a there. Hello, Ralph. Angel Barboni Smith is in the house. Hello, Angel. Laura Scalambrin is in Northwest Italy. Ciao, Laura. Lovely to see you. I'm not sure if you're a newcomer, but you'll be made welcome anyway. Carol Barrett says, Giariv uh, de Galiev. And, and uh, Carol is in Galway, which is lovely. Hello, Carol. Jim Conway says, Thanks for the chat room. Forgive the hairdo, says Jim. I was saying, not. Don't worry, we had a little bit of a chat room last night. I was just testing out the new uh, uh, chat room feature on, on Facebook. And uh, we, we were just saying, everybody has a COVID hairstyle. So it's no, there's no problem. Everybody's locked down. Mike and Jeanette Naylor are in Princeton in New Jersey and are watching. Lovely to see you guys, as always. Sharon Musavi Dorani. And it's gone because I'm so far behind. Hello. And I... Todd Despera is saying hello, hello, Todd. Hello, Patrick Rowan. Hello, Laura O'Reilly is in Madrid. Hello, Ronan Farrell. Lovely to see you. Mariana Dunn says hello, Saskia. Warmest greetings to Anthony and Artur from Alexandria, Virginia. Hi, Mariana. I have to be quick because they're actually disappearing and I can't bring them back. Barbara Kling says good afternoon. Hello, Barbara. Dave Russell. Hi, Anthony. And beautiful, beautiful tribe from Derry. Hello, Dave. Nice to see you. As always, Angel Barboni Smith. Oh, sorry. Wasn't supposed to do that. Hello to all. Laura O'Reilly, deadly topic. Brilliant. Glad you think so. Hopefully you'll enjoy. Patricia McAteer, I know this is close to you. Patricia, you'll enjoy this one, I'm sure. Demi Woe says, it's a beautiful day in Colorado. Barely a cloud in the sky. Wonderful stuff. Kristen Gray, Taggart, Tnonoa, Anton Agustatua from Northern California. Our son is back. Delighted to hear it, Kristen. Jules Cousin says, hello, Giagrich. Lilis O'Leara says, I saw the comment. Okay. Yeah, and you are right. Okay, fair enough. Look, we don't normally have a problem. And if you guys see somebody who's causing trouble, you know what to do. Send them out the door. But thanks a million. And lovely to have you along, Lillis. Dawn Hilton says, love from Lancashire. Grow more, Dawn. Kathy May Dayo says, good evening, Mr. Anthony. Hello, Tua. I missed yesterday. My dear cousin passed away suddenly, so took a day out to grieve, but needed to come back here for some cheer. I'm very sorry to hear that. Our sincerest condolences to you, Kathy, on your sad loss. Uh, that's terrible news. Moody evening in Mullingar, says uh, Margaret Kiernan. Mullin Mullingar, the strange mill. Rain threatening, Anthony. Yeah, indeed. It's looking very dull. Tim Doyle says, hello. Hi, Tim. John Roach, booking a room at Dodurgas. Do you have a room? Not difficult, that. <laughs> Can we park the L chariot? Not difficult, that. Do you do food? Not difficult, that. Can we check out early without wounds? <laughs> difficult, that. <laughs> uh, brilliant. I love it. I love it. I love it. It was over 200 a minute ago, Margaret. I can't believe how many. We seem to be getting a, uh, a lot of... Uh, a visit, uh, 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 an extra charge of visitors these days. Tom King says, good evening, Anthony, and the fellow to a uh, hope all in good form. All great, Tom, all in good form. Thank you, Jack Durkin says, hi, Evan Giagwich. Long team NOC says, hail fellow to a uh, hail Anthony. I brought this along just in case there's any withdrawal symptoms and it's an image link, which I can't see. But there you go. Debbie Daly says, thank you for keeping us kindly, Anthony. Greetings from California. Greetings right back to you, Debbie. 
Trenonoa, Kimberly Field Sippola says hi Anthony and Netflix fans. Looking forward to hearing about Ireland's Stonehenge. Good stuff. Regina Riley is in County Longford. Fall to Regina. Tony O'Neill says, good afternoon from Toronto. Banachti, Tony, uh, Anton. Susan Scott says, hello to Anthony and all. Happy to be here. Hoping you are, all, you are all well and safe. I'm so looking forward to today's episode on Ireland Stonehenge. Brilliant stuff. Megan Walter says, hi all. Giovich, Paula Snow Queen says, hello. Banachti. Paul Garron says, hello, Andrew. Down down there. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, and uh, good evening to you, Paul. Slauncher. Uh, uh, Hello, Anthony from Alwyn, Roy Badziak. Look for, looking forward to this, this evening's detective story. Good stuff. Kimberly Halligan says hello to everyone from sunny New York. Brilliant. So glad to catch the live session. We're glad that you are here, Kimberly. Pull up a stool, grab a, a brew or a dram, and enjoy yourself. Hi, Anthony, says Yvette. Learning so much. Loved Dodderga's Hostel. Eager for tonight's show. Hello, Yvette. Good to see you. I hope you enjoyed your noodles. Jules Cousins. I missed last night. Missed you all, but back tonight. Porig O'Komiski. Hello, Anthony. Just up the, it's just up the road for me. Porig uh, is a, a very a man who's do, done a lot of visiting of Irish ancient sites and a lot of posting of very excellent pictures and information about St. Porig. It's lovely to see you. The last time we saw each other was in February, or was it January? It was February. I think it was February. Up at... Uh, Fornox, I hope you're in good form. Jennifer Foley, enjoying your pictures, by the way. Jennifer Foley, feel free to post those straight to the Mythical Ireland community, by the way, Porik. Our, our, our community will love those pictures. Jennifer Foley says, hello, everyone. Tired and sore from gardening all day. Definitely need this break. Will you sit down and relax yourself, Jennifer, and uh, and enjoy, enjoy the stories? Josephine Meehan says, Trononawa. Anthony and Tua, end of my work week. Yeah, celebrating with a wee glass of vino, a very blustery Donegal. So perfect evening for a story. Very nice to have you in the house, Josephine. Michael Marr is watching. Hello, Ma Michael. Connoisseur too. Maeve Fina Callahan says hello, Anthony, and all the Mythflix Tua. And hello to you also, Maeve. Emka, Emka says, hello, I am new here, but I love Irish myths and your videos are great. Greetings from Slovakia. You're very, very welcome. Falce. Cade Miele of a 100,000 welcomes to you, Emka. Dawn Hilton says some amazing unrecorded circles at the Burren. Yes, and my good friend Matthew Kelly found an unrecorded, uh, I think it was a ring fort, uh, uh, near Doolan in County Clare recently, reported to National Monument Service and recorded within 24 hours. Fantastic stuff. Maggie Pratt says she's sitting on our back porch in Nor North Carolina listening to frogs during the third rainy day in a, in a row complete with storms and lightning and lots of thunder. Hopefully you can hear us over all that noise, Maggie, but you're very welcome. Billy Sullivan says, Geogritch from Middlesex, North Carolina. Fantastic. Welcome, Billy. Falcha. Carol Paul says, she's watching. Falcha, Carol. Teresa McGuinness, Callahan, Florida, checking in. Falcha, Teresa, Geogritch. Cy B says, hi to hi. Falcha, Roshin O'Connor Lawrence says, hello, to which we say, Giagage. <laughs> a great pleasure to have you all. Giagive says, Nora Gaffney O'Connor, Golair, Anthony Augustua, a fabulous morning swim in sparkly waters, but cold and cloudy now. Have my book ready, Anthony. Brilliant. Chapter 4.4, Nora, if you're there. Veronica Casey says, hi, everyone. Invited my mammy along. She's 83 years young. Hello, Veronica, and hello, Veronica's mam. Laura Scalambreen says, ciao. Ciao, indeed. Nick Eska Casterton says, good evening, Anthony and the Tua. Hope you're all okay. We're in great form. Uh, Patricia McAteer, I lost Facebook for a minute or so, so I'm a little behind on the feed. That's no problem, Patricia. It's good to have you along anyway. Barbara Murphy, another Murphy in the house. Hello from a lovely cool day in Tucson, Arizona. Only going to be 90, 32.2 degrees. Only. That's like the warmest. That's up there with the warmest temperature ever recorded in Ireland. And you're saying it's cool. Wow. That's Arizona for you. There you go. Evening from South Africa, says Rowan Emilio Naidu. Very nice to have you along, Rowan. Falcha. Cindy Williams says hi from a very rainy Ohio. Well, I'll tell you, we're looks like we're going to be sharing that kind of weather, at least for tonight. Uh, Falcha, Cindy. Aaron Durrett is watching. Hello, Aaron. Giagic, Porig Okomsky. It's just up the road for me. Hope you're well, Anthony. Yes, indeed, Porig, in good form. Maggie Pratt from Emerald Isle, North Carolina. Carolina, heavy rainstorms. Brendan Long says, Trenonawa, enjoy your shows. Hello, Brendan. Falcha. 
Aaron Duret is back from work. Love to the Tua sisters and brothers and our wonderful Anthony. Hello, Aaron, with the lovely Irish name. Kimberly, feel simple. Cathy, sorry to hear that. Glad you are back. May Anya, greetings from Mid Coast, Maine. Hello and good evening. Louise Sherrill says hello. Falche. Michelle Hoffman says hello from California. Jake Rich, Michelle. Desire Riley is saying good evening. Hope all are well. Back in Louisiana, but not for long. I missed the last few live episodes because I road tripped to Colorado and loved it so much. I'm going back next Friday for two weeks to look for permanent Colorado lodgings. Brilliant stuff, Desire. Good luck with that from all of us to you. Sue Elgin says greetings from a thunderstorm on the prairie of South Dakota. Stay safe, Sue. Trenonoa, good evening to you. Welcome to all the new viewers, says Aaron. Yes, indeed. Regina Riley says, thanks, Anthony. You're an inspiration. Uh, thank you, Regina. Uh, you're very welcome along. Brendan Long says, Toshe Korbosti on Shot Igorki. Nothing new there. It's raining in Cork, and apparently that's nothing new. Grace Walker is in sunny uh, Long Island, New York. Blessings to all. Hello, Grace Trononawa. Okay, okay, Philo Kernunos Nichols says hello, folks. Geoglitch, Philo. Kate Graham says hello from Arizona next to the Na Navajo res Reservation. Thank you, Irish contributors, for your help fulfilling their pandemic needs. Yes, indeed. A very nice gesture. Falcha, Kate. You're welcome. very welcome along to Live Irish Mits. Monica Regley says hi. Monica from Switzerland. Ternonawa, Monica, good evening to you. Falcha, welcome. Pull up a chair. Make yourself comfortable. Drinks at the ready, says Paul Blockley. Looking forward to tonight's Midflix. Nice warm evening in South Wales. Yes, indeed. Okay. Right. Oh, hello from Ditchling, Sussex, says Kate Taylor. Good evening, Kate Falcher, Veronica Casey. Yeah, yay. Hey, Mammy. I see you watching. Yeah, brilliant. Kirsten Salisbury's in the house. Hi, friends. Looking forward to decoding the mystery of the stones. Hello, Kirsten. Not difficult, that. Emily Boland says hello from Texas. Boland's from Sligo here. Hello, Emily. Falche. Banachti. Lloyd Stilwell says, having technical difficulties. Have to watch later when I get home. Oh, that's uh, unfortunate, Lloyd. Uh, but you'll be able to catch up, I'm sure, hopefully. Susan Mullen. La Serna is in Raleigh, North Carolina, where it's raining. Thunderstorms here as well, says Philo. There you go. Seems to be a common theme. Annie Newton says, hi, folks. Hope you're all well. Hi, Annie. Falcha. Uh, Elisa Jensen says, listening to you while I paint in my small home studio. That sounds wonderful, Elisa. And we've had a lot of people uh, creating a lot of art around this series, which has been wonderful. Uh, lovely to see people being creative. Uh, Lucy Robinson says, good evening to uh, Devon chiming in. Turn on what, Lucy. Falcha. Uh, Griselda says hi from Kent in the UK. Falje, Griselda, it's very nice to have you along. Mary Hanrahan says she's in New Mexico. I should have been back in the Burren this month. And not to worry, Mary, hopefully it's just a postponement and you'll be back soon. Linda Jacobs Hanley says hello from Georgia. Trinonoa, Linda, Falje, Dean T says rainbows all. Helen Guinan, hello, almost late. Hello, everyone. Your Majesty. Saskia is bowing as well, aren't you? Are you going to say hello? Tony O'Neill says it's sunny in Ontario and a beautiful day. Glad to hear it, Tony. Fault you. Marie O'Donnell says hi from Tipperary. Gia Glitch, Marie. Oh, we're up to date. Uh, Mallory Fennessy says hello from France on YouTube. Icha Anto says the Woodsies uh, from Monaster Boyce. Lovely to have you all in the house. Jackie Stevenson says hello to Nancy and Mallory. Slauncha All says Kevin Anderson from rural Indiana, USA. Sandrine Brady, watching you on my TV screen tonight. Brilliant, beautiful evening here. 25 Celsius and warm sunset in France. Hi to everyone. Bonsoir, Sandrine. Hi from Merseyside, says Jerry Andrades. Hello, Jerry. Falche. Vicky Wallace Southern says hello, my lovely friends. Good evening, Vicky, and I hope Evan is with you. Good evening. Hello, Evan. Hope you are enjoying the show lots of new to at tonight for some reason don't know where they're all coming from but you're all so pull up the biggest bench that you can possibly think of think of the derga's hostel with all its rooms and apartments and everything else anyway let me know if karen gogus arrives uh I, I haven't seen him so far and if he does arrive i'd like to give him another credit uh what what are we on 
Uh, oh my goodness me, 20 minutes. Wow. Long introductions, but not to worry. Tonight, folks, we are delving more into archaeology and history and perhaps a little bit less into mythology, but I think you'll find the story of Ireland Stonehenge very interesting. Ireland Stonehenge is something that raised its head for me uh, during the early years of research with Richard Moore uh, when we were researching for our first book, Island of the Setting Sun, which gives it a fairly substantial mention in a portion of a chapter called The Giant Rings. Or stone circles, the giant rings. Hello, Julianne Osborne, Falcha. Um, and over the years, it's something that has interested me greatly, particular, particularly related to its fate, what happened to it. Uh, and so I'm going to read, I'm going to read to you, uh, and I may interject that with uh, uh, occasional um, uh, tangents and uh, disappearances down rabbit holes. Uh, and walking through labyrinths and that sort of thing. Um, I was always interested in it from the moment I first heard about it. Um, and it, its story and the story of my discovery of Drone Henge actually cross over quite a bit. It is, or it was, a similar type monument, except for Drone Henge was largely made of timber and Ireland Stonehenge was made of quite a lot of stone. What happened to it and what made it vanish? Well, hopefully you can stay along for the story. Hang on till I just check. It's something I didn't do before the... Ah, we'll be finished in no time. We'll be finished in no time. Um, and perhaps when we are, we can uh, even carry on the discussion and take questions, etc., etc. Et <coughs> uh, the story begins in 1999 because that was the year that myself and Richard got together and started our research and that is really the birth of Mythical Ireland because I set up the Mythical Ireland website a year later in March of 2000 so it's uh, over 20 years old today the Mythical Ireland website uh, and long after Island of the Setting Sun was published I was still interested in following its fate and the story behind it and for a period of time, I was the editor of the Dundalk Democrat newspaper. And I know any of you who are sort of local to Louth or the area will know about the intense rivalry between my hometown of Drogheda and the town of Dundalk. It happens that I have family roots in Dundalk. I don't usually talk about that in front of the Drogheda, Drogheda heads, uh, but uh, some of them are watching tonight, so I can't escape it. Um, and uh, researching in the county library in Dundalk and in the old archives, uh, of the newspaper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I and also I was introduced to the landowner, the person who owns the land upon which uh, Stone, the Ireland's Stonehenge is located. I was able to piece together something of an interesting history of it, and I was even able to find out perhaps what had happened to it. So I hope you enjoy the story of the fate of Ireland's Stonehenge. And this is I'm going to read a, a chapter from my book, Mythical Ireland: New Light on the Ancient Past. And the chapter is 4.4. .4. Uh, uh, those of you who have Mythical Ireland will know it's broken into sections. Section 4 is called Megaliths and Monuments. And the chapter 4.4 .4 is called... No, we, we better not read that out because it's a bit of a spoiler. We don't want to do another Dadurga's Hostel on it. So here we go. Uh, and it's good to see you all. No, that is that is also another of the several destroyed or very largely damaged complexes of monuments in and around the Dundalk area. If the complex of monuments was still standing, I have no doubt that Dundalk's uh, northern and western and even southwestern fringes in the countryside to the west of Dundalk northwest west and southwest would uh would boast a monument complex that would be up there with bruna bonia believe it or not for years i have been drawing attention to a monument sadly now destroyed which has been dubbed ireland's stonehenge this was a remarkable and unique monument consisting of several concentric circles of stone surrounded by a large earthen embankment all of which was encompassed by 10 enormous megaliths. A monoliths is actually the word I use here. 
Ireland Stonehenge was documented by antiquarian and astronomer Thomas Wright in 1746. And by the way, I should say to you that it was not known as Ireland Stonehenge back then, and he did not refer to it as Ireland's Stonehenge. Monica, yes, you can buy Mythical Ireland on my website. I don't have copies at the moment, but I should be able to get copies in the next week. You'll get a signed copy if you order it through my website. <clears throat> His drawing, that is Thomas Wright's drawing, is the only known representation of this once great monument, which was located in a townland known today as Carnbeg, not far from the town of Dundalk in the north of County Louth. I first wrote about Ireland Stonehenge in Island of the Setting Sun. The story of Ireland Stonehenge is tinged with sadness. It is a tale of something magnificent, something unique and something very ancient, which disappeared into the mists of time. Is there yet some possibility, I wonder, of a resurrection? Pardon me, I need to take a drink. Yeah, the old mouth's a bit dry. This huge monument vanished from existence sometime between Wright's 1746 drawing and brief description of it appeared in Laudiana, which is the name of his book in which he detailed and drew lots and lots of the monuments of the Laud area. And the construction of the Drogheda to Porta Down section of the Dublin Belfast railway line in 1855. Historian Henry Morris writing for the County Louth Archaeological Journal in 1907, gave us a tantalizing insight into what the monument's purpose might have been when he wrote, I have read or heard it stated somewhere that this place was the site of a school of astronomy. Its position on the plain with a semicircle of mountains around would enable an ancient astronomer to observe and mark the places where the various heavenly bodies appeared on the horizon at different times of the year. Regrettably, Morris was unable to recall the source of this valuable detail. Doris O'Hara says, hello everyone, sorry, late today, no brown zone, no worries, Doris. Life is life and people have to work and do all sorts of household chores and stuff. There's no need to apologize, make yourself comfortable, Pull up a stool, grab yourself a brew, and uh, enjoy this. Enjoy the story. So, sorry. Regrettably, Morris was unable to recall the source of this valuable detail. However, he might have read about this in James Bonwick's 1894 book, Irish Druids and Old Irish, pardon me, Old Irish Religions. There, Bonwick referred to a place called. Carrick Broda, and that's C-A-O-R-I-C-K, B-R-A-U-D-A, -A -A, Carrick Broda of Dundalk, which he said was, quote, renowned for astronomical observations, unquote. Adam Hodgson, in his letters from North America, elaborated somewhat. Tradition, Damien says, missed most of this. Fascinated, putting kids to bed and all that. Don't worry, Damien, but we've actually only just started, so you've only missed a couple of minutes. Tradition sometimes conveys along the stream of time a name attached to these stone monuments, which informs us of their use. In Aaron's Bright Green Isle, which was a famous resort of the Druids, these stone circles placed upon an eminence are called in the Irish language, Carrick Broda, same spelling as before. Laura Adomi Troy is in the house, says good evening, Trinonawa, hello. And in Wales, similar structures have retained the name Carrick Broiden. Now, I, I, I'm undoubtedly butchering the pronunciation. C-E-O-R-I-G-B-R-U-D-Y-N. If you any, any Welsh speakers in the house, please assist us with our pronunciation. Carrick Broiden to the present time. The appellation is the same in both countries and means astronomers' circles. Liz Pierce says, hello, Geoglitch, Liz. Uh, and, of course, if you follow the footnotes, 
Uh, and I'm I'm a devil for, of course, not just for providing them, which I believe is very important if you're writing about such things, but also in following them. Hodgson, 1824, uh, uh, and Hodgson, 1824, is his, I think that was online. I don't have a physical copy of that. Adam Hodgson, Letters from North America, Hurst Robinson and Company, and A. Constable and Company. So there you go, an early 19th century work. Neither Bonwick nor Hodgson elucidate the etymology of the word broda. However, a number of sources repeat this supposed etymological link between Carrig broda and Carrig broiden. Carrick is from Irish Carrig, C A R R A I G, which means rock, but the derivation of broda is a little bit obscure, to say the least. In volume one of Monumenta Antiqua, published in 1799, Edward King similarly asserts that, quote, there is also an astronomer's circle of stones not far from Dundalk called Carrick Broda. King cites Wright's Lothiana as his source. However, there seems to be some confusion here. The fort of Carrick Broad, described by Wright in Lothiana, is a different monument to the one at Carnbeg we have come to know as Ireland's Stonehenge, and is, or rather was, as it too has since been destroyed. In fact, located in the town of Rasky, or A-S-K-E-A-G-H, two and a half kilometres to the north of Carnbeg. So what I'm saying here is that uh, Edward King had mistakenly had mistaken uh, the Ballynahattan or Carnbeg circle that we call Ireland Stonehenge with a different one detailed by Wright as the Fort of Carrick Broad, and it would appear that several others carried on that mistake afterwards. How do you spell bro bro Broader uh, Leather Hull? The way it's spelled, Katrina, and it's undoubtedly uh, uh, it's a bastardization. It, it doesn't look like, well, I'll spell it for you. The way it's spelled here is C-A-O-R-I-C-K and separate word, Broda, B-R-A-U-D-A, B-R-A-U-D-A, Broda. Um, and the Welsh, Kerig Broiden, B-R-U-D-Y-N. So I'm not sure if that helps, but perhaps Katrina can help us with a little bit of the research into the meaning of the name. Wright does not propose a name for the Stonehenge, other than to say it is located, quote, on the plains of Ballynahatna near Dundalk, unquote. Now, this is very interesting, well, and, and we'll get to it, of course, but this is one of the reasons that the location of Ireland Stonehenge was lost, because uh, Wright described it as being on the plains of Ballynahatna. It was wrongly, therefore, assumed that it was in the townland of Ballynahatna outside Dundalk. Uh, when in fact it was located in an, an adjoining townland to the northwest called Carnbeg. There is another townland uh, northwest of that again called Carnmore, suggesting that there was perhaps in some time in the past uh, a small monument of stones and a big monument of stones, etc., etc. And another very interesting thing about this is that some of you will be interested or will be familiar with. Um, You'll be interested in, okay, it may be that um, somebody is trying to spam us here. So uh, if that's the case, please do uh, point them out and uh, we'll kick them out. Don't worry. Um, Ballynahatna or Ballynahattan is very like the town of townland name of Ballynahatty outside Belfast, which is the location of the Giant's Ring, which is the largest embanked enclosed a late Neolithic henge structure on the island of Ireland, uh, anywhere on in Ireland. Clearly, the Stonehenge at Carnbeg and the fort at Rasky, Carrick Broad, uh, are two different monuments. Is it possible that one scholar mistakenly identified a linguistic link between Carrick Broad and Carrick Broiden, and that all others subsequently copied this mistake? Yeah. Did the same scholar perhaps confuse the monuments described in Lothiana and, sometime, and somehow come to believe that the great Stonehenge of Ballynahatna was in fact called Carrick Broad? 
Whatever the answer to that question is, the fact remains that both of these now destroyed monuments were located relatively close to each other. Perhaps there was a stronger local tradition or some indigenous source referred to by Henry Morris that was more explicit in describing the Stonehenge as a school of astronomy. I can't block them at the moment because I actually have to go into their names separately. So uh, I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, just ignore it, folks. Ignore it for the moment. Perhaps there was a stronger local tradition or some indigenous source referred to by Henry Morris that was more explicit in describing the Stonehenge as a school of astronomy. We may never know. Yeah, Katrina says, can't find a word in Irish anywhere close to Broda for astronomer. And, and likewise, Katrina, nor could I when I was looking. Um, so it's an interesting one. I don't know uh, how, this, uh, uh, how this occurred. What we can say with certainty is that there is a hill just to the north of these monuments, now located just across the border in County Armagh in Northern Ireland, in a townland called Carrick Broad. C-A-R-R-I-C-K-B-R-O-A-D. This hill has a prehistoric cairn near its summit. The name Carrick Broad is derived from Carrick Broad, B or A Fada G H A D. And that is uh, translated as Rock of the Neck or Gorge. In place names, the word is applied to a gorge or deeply cut glen. It is suggested locally that the gorge might be on Glan Boo, on the edge of Carrick Broad and neighbouring Tiff Crum townland where a narrow road sweeps through under steep rocky inclines on both sides. In recent years, it has been suggested that the lost monument we now know as Ireland's Stonehenge might have been part of Enoch Arby Rofir, the place where Cúchulainn is said to have buried his son Cunla and, quote, the site of an assembly he planned to host at the end of the harvest at Samhain, which he was, or Savin, uh, according to the old Irish, isn't it? An M with a lenition is a V, Savin. Alex Casterton says, uh, can't be on tonight. Having some time with my brother, uh, having a few pints of them. No problem at all, Alex. Alex and we'll uh, catch you on the rewind. Uh, and a good evening to you. Thanks for letting us know which he was prevented from convening because of a spell cast on him by two women of the she. And uh, that last part is, of course, repeated uh, or quoted or referenced from the work uh, of Ronald Hicks, uh, a very long time friend of mine, the one who I met by the most amazing coincidence at um, Millmount, in summer at summer solstice in 2005 which was a big part of the episode we did on synchronicity uh synchronicity serendipity and spontaneity um and the the work that's being referenced here if i can find it apologies is some correlations between henge enclosures and anox sites and that's from the journal of the royal society of antiquaries of ireland volume 139 2009 No, I've lost my place. I do apologise. Yes, sorry. So uh, Ronald Hicks thinks uh, Ireland Stonehenge might have been part of this Enoch site. Of course, that goes hand in hand, doesn't it? Uh, Dronehenge, Enoch in Broga, uh, all of the henges at Brunabonia, part of a, a, an assembly site of the late Neolithic and perhaps then continuously into later times and, and early historic times. So this is the place where Cúchulainn is said to have buried his son, Cúnla. That is the son he killed at the Baltre Standing Stones. Uh, so you may want to refer back to that episode, which isn't that long ago, uh, sometime around a week ago, I reckon, wasn't it? Uh, pardon me, I'll just find out. For those of you who are just interested in following these threads, especially those of the newcomers who haven't been watching all the episodes, uh, episode number 65 was about Baltre, uh, and we talked about Cúchulainn and 
uh, the killing of his son Conrad. And here we go. So from Baltray to uh, Carnbeg or Ballynahattan, uh, and Enoch Arby Rofir, where Hicks reckons uh, Ireland Stonehenge was part of that complex where Cuchulain buried his son. And he planned to host at the end of the harvest, Samhain, uh, 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 an assembly, but was prevented from doing so by two women of the Shi, which is fascinating. And Enoch is a traditional assembly site, and that's O-E-N-A-C-H. And I think the, the alternative uh, Irish spelling is A-O-N-A-C-H, Enoch. Ronald Hicks of Ball State University in Indiana has attempted to identify some of the Enoch sites, demonstrating that they occur in conjunction with monuments known as henge enclosures. Bear in mind, folks, and this is one of the reasons that this work overlaps uh, the Drone Henge, is that this book was written and published in, well, it was a lot of it was written in 2017 and published in 2017. It was published uh, 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 up to, well, it was nine months, I'd say, before the discovery of Drone Henge. Uh, and there, I'm just going to show you, hopefully you can see that. That is Wright's drawing of Ireland Stonehenge, what he called the Druid's Circles, or, or the uh, the Druid's Temple of the Plains of Ballynahattan near Dundalk. That is the only representation we have of this wonderful monument. And were it not for Wright's uh, drawing in the mid-18th century, we would not know it had existed uh, and the story of its rediscovery actually might, you know, let, let's just say we'd never have understood its true significance were it not for Wright and uh, the fact that he, he, he made these drawings. Hicks has devoted four decades of his career to identifying henges from among the 40,000 or so circular prehistoric earthworks known and of course you could probably add a couple of thousand to that because in the past couple of years a huge number have been discovered due to drought uh, conditions the place name tales in the dinchemicus assert that at least in the case of the more illustrious anox sites they quote resembled historical fairs but with political and ritual overtones unquote and of course we had an episode separate so of interest to people who are joining us the Baltray episode 65 we had an episode about Ireland uh, about Drone Henge I'll find that for you in a moment and we also had an episode about Enoch Talchin the Irish Olympic Games which is another of the big Enoch sites it's the the big the, the big one and that was episode 53 episode the episode on Drone Henge was episode 26 Many of them had links with the celebration of Lunasa, that is, many of the Enoch sites. But the Enoch Arby Rofir is an obvious exception with its Samhain assembly. And so I think what's being suggested here is that Lunasa marked the beginning of the harvest and that Samhain was when all, the harvest was all over and everything had been harvested. Eber Benson is watching. Hello, Eber. Uh, nice to see you. Falche. One of the greatest difficulties of Hicks's task in identifying the Enigi is that, quote, there is no clear description of them. And this is another quote. Such sites are usually thought of as open areas. But there is evidence that at least in some cases, the term may refer to an enclosed area or structure. It's getting very dull out there. Are you saying hello? Come here. Come on up and say hello. Come here. Come here. Come on up and say hello. Come on. Come on up and say hello. No. Say hello. Oh. She... <laughs> she doesn't like being on people's laps. There you go. She says hello. Furthermore, the Enigi are not isolated monuments, but rather part of complexes that include other monuments of various sorts. Ronald Hicks says that these complexes were likely to have covered a lot of ground. One other bit of supporting evidence is that two of three, 
two of three possible stone circles in County Louth listed by the Archaeological Survey are within three kilometres. Also, the townland names of Carnmore and Carnbeg suggest that at least two other prehistoric monuments existed nearby. Yeah, she is a uh, uh, she is a, a Siberian husky. She's actually eight years old. Everybody thinks she's a pup because she's a small dog. She's a small husky. She was the runt of the litter, and she's a very, very quiet girl. Doesn't bark much, very rarely. The only time she barks is when she's looking for food, and she just growls. And uh, she's very, very easy to manage. Coda, completely different story, completely different kettle of fish. He's completely nuts. Like, she's been in here the whole episode, and apart from changing position on the floor, she hasn't made a sound. If he was in here, he'd be chewing wires and chewing desks and trying to get socks and things and probably trying to take books off the shelf. Not long after Wright's drawing of Ireland Stonehenge was published, the Armagh Road was built, probably in the early 1750s. And there can be no doubt that this was a significant factor in the destruction of the Stonehenge. I overlaid Wright's drawing of the monument onto satellite imagery of the site, and this makes it obvious that at least some of the monument was flattened to make way for the new road. This very straight section of road intersected the monument and its construction would have wrought much damage. But the road was not the only destructive factor at work. Some of the stones from the Carnbeg Henge were taken for other uses too. Writing in 1880, James Bonwick said, quote, Many of the best circles have been destroyed to furnish road metal, gate posts, etc. Unquote. Uh, basically, the, the stones of the hallowed monument were carted away, some of them broken up to be used as the foundation material uh, for, I, I have no doubt about it, the Armagh Road when it was built. Uh, was was the, the 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 factor that caused the most significant destruction, and that others were carted off to be used as gate gate posts. Henry Morris could find no remains of the monument in 1907, saying that it was quote gone, cleared away, its very site not exactly known unquote, uh, and and that it wasn't a case that you know that the monument had been damaged and you could see parts of it left. The whole thing vanished from the surface of the earth. It was not until 1988 that the exact location of Wright's Druidic Temple was finally rediscovered. Archaeologist Victor Buckley, who lives in Drogheda, by the way, and is a longtime friend of mine, was able to discern the monument's footprint, and I have footprint in quotes, in an aerial photograph which had been taken 18 years earlier in 1970 for the Cambridge University collection of aerial photographs. And uh, all of us archaeological researchers know that as KUCAP, Cambridge University Collection of Aerial Photographs. That collection is all online, by the way, folks, folks on a website. Remind me afterwards and I'll share the link with the page and the community. Um, and you can see the image from which, and actually, I might be able to show you that uh, from Island of the Setting Sun. If I didn't re, if it wasn't reprinted here, which it wasn't, I'll show it to you later. And so, uh, Kukap, uh, the Cambridge images are invaluable because they show monuments in the landscape from the sixties and seventies, even though um, you know intensive agriculture had been practiced for a number of decades. The countryside is still pristinely preserved in some cases, and further damage has occurred since then. Uh, I'm not sure if I mention it here, um, but but uh, uh, the field in which the Henge was located eventually became a golf course. And so Ireland's Stonehenge right now lies beneath an actually a disused golf club, uh, golf course. It was a golf course for about, I'm, I'm not sure if it was there for a decade or maybe a couple of decades, um, a disused golf course and a roadway into a hotel, which was, uh, they made the, the, when the hotel was being built, they made sure the road bent around the site rather than going across it so that no more damage was done. 
because of course there may still be plenty of remains beneath the ground keep watching there was some archaeological geophysics carried out at the site in 2006 in advance of a proposed housing development which didn't materialize because the irish economy subsequently collapsed standing at the site of the stonehenge which is now part of a disused golf course attached to a hotel why do i always preempt these things it is very difficult to get any sense that it was anything other than a field there are simply no stones remaining however i've recently discovered something significant about what might have happened to the large stones or at least some of them in the most unlikely of sources reading george henry bassett's louth county guide and directory 1886 we find that early on hello kelly edmiston is there hello kelly long time no see my friend Happy Ascension Day, Captain Anthony. Well, greetings to you, Kelly. I hope you're in good form. Sorry, I, I, and I got so excited there. Yes, uh, Bassett in 1886 makes reference to the area's, area's antiquities. The remains of antiquity are very numerous, of course, this is a quote, and extend through every part of the country. They continue in very much the same condition that they were found more than 125 years ago by Thomas Wright, author of Laudiana. His work was instrumental in stimulating the curiosity of many of the residents of the county in regard to the precise nature of the contents of the Danish and Irish forts and druidical camps. And it's very interesting, uh, 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 you know, how a, a lot of early Irish monuments were ascribed to the Danes or the Vikings. But um, interestingly, uh, a lot of them are ascribed to the Tua de Danans. And it has often been suggested that uh, de Danans and Danes were con were uh, conflated. And in fact, when you see Danish, it actually refers to the de Danans more so than the Vikings. Somebody has come home and code is getting excited. And here we find the most valuable information pertaining to what happened to this once marvellous monument. It had not the effect, however, of preventing a tenant near Dundalk from effacing the druidical circle at Ballynahatna. Of the ten stones which were said to represent the generations from Adam to Noah, and that, of course, is, as, is not, not, nothing to do with the tradition of the site, it, it, it was what Wright had written about the stones, that there were 10 numbering the generations from Adam to, to Noah. Only one now stands in the original position, and that was a, published in 1886. Most of the rest were dropped into holes sunk behind them and covered at a sufficient depth to escape the plough. Now, I know it is not uh, what we would call uh, a resurrection as such, but what it means is that uh, the largest of the stones may still be there. Uh, and rather than being broken up like the smaller stone circles, they might still be there. And at some point, they may be able to be repositioned into their original positions. This is most interesting. Bassett says that instead of being broken up like the smaller stones, the large ones were dropped into huge holes to bury them. This is quite exciting as it leads to the possibility that at least some of these large megaliths are still there, buried where they once stood. Donna says hello from, I missed it, the comments are flying off the screen. Hello from Ohio, Donna Nugent, Falcha Donna. Perhaps this is information which might lead archaeologists towards, towards further investigation of the site at Carnbeg. Certainly, Ronald Hicks thinks so. Quote, the 2006 resistivity survey makes it clear that significant traces of the monument remain. If indeed the stones were buried, a survey of the whole site using other modern geophysical prospecting methods, such as magnetometry or ground penetrating radar, should have no difficulty locate, locating them. Melo Nello, who is Neil, says, hello, Anthony and Tua. Sorry I'm late. Hope you're all well. All good for him. No brown zone. Melo, good to see you. Uh, Stella Wielden says, Cooey from Coolangatta in Queensland in Australia. Brilliant stuff. Very good morning to you. Majin Ma, Stella, lovely to have you along. One of the greatest tragedies connected with the disappearance of Ireland Stonehenge 
uh, is how and why it was vandalised during the time the Coulter family were a resident at Carnbeg. Records show that the Coulters, who lived at Carnbeg during the time of Wright's visit and the probable subsequent destruction of the Stonehenge, had an interest in antiquarian matters and the preservation of monuments. Beginning around 1731, Samuel Coulter rented lands at Carnbeg and the adjoining townland, Carnmore, from James Hamilton, Viscount or Lord Limerick. It was Lord Limerick who was likely to have been the one who invited Thomas Wright to Ireland. Laudiana was actually dedicated to Lord Limerick, and during his time in Ireland, Wright even taught mathematics to some of the well-to-do families of the day. In his journal, Wright wrote that in October of 1746, he, quote, collected and drew all the plans of Laudiana and taught Mr. Hamilton and Miss Fortescue and Mr. Reed, etc., mathematics and drawing. <laughs> Samuel Coulter died in 1760. The farm probably passed at that stage to his younger brother, Thomas. And after his death in 1769, Carnbeg would have been administered by his executors until 1776, when Thomas's son, Samuel, came of age. This Samuel, a nephew of the Samuel who was at Carnbeg during Wright's era, was described as a, quote, scholarly man, quote, unquote, who kept a small library at Carnbeg. Among his books was a copy of Wright's Laudiana. This is hardly surprising, given that Wright had probably spent a lot of time at Carnbeg years previously. His other books included a copy of the Toyne, a copy of Edward Lloyd's Archaeologica Britannica, and a copy of Charles Valency's Irish Grammar. Samuel evidently passed on his love of antiquities to his son, Dr. Thomas Coulter, who became a botanist. According to his biography, Thomas was upset about how locals treated a monument on his lands at a townland called The Stump. The monument, known as the Ship Temple, had an Irish name, Fos Nahem Icha, which means the work of one night. He prosecuted individuals who were carting away stone from that monument, probably to use for field boundaries and gateposts. Was Thomas Wright's action in prosecuting these, vanual, these vandals born out of some sense of guilt for what had happened to the Stonehenge back in his uncle's stewardship of the Carnbeg lands when the Armagh Road was built? And of course, that's just me asking that question. Mike Beckett is in the room. Fulcher, Mike, you're welcome. Or was the building of the road and the vandalism of the Stonehenge that likely resulted out of Coulter's hands? Did Lord Limerick perhaps allow the road to cross his land? If so, did he, do, did he allow for the destruction of the monument? And more importantly, did he benefit financially from the construction of the road? We might never know. One of the authors of the biography of Tom, Dr. Thomas Coulter was E. Charles Nelson. In correspondence a number of years ago, he said that he was unable to add anything to the information he had included in the book and that, quote, there was nothing in the Coulter papers that I saw that is likely to shed any light on the destruction of the monument, unquote. He added, it is an interesting problem, certainly, but as Murphy must know, he was referring to me to a third party. It is an interesting problem, certainly. But as Murphy must know, there was no respect for archaeological sites in the past. Even in the present, the government does not protect archaeological sites in the appropriate manner. Whether archaeology or the Irish government can do anything in the near future to rescue this lost monument from the mists of time remains to be seen. In the meantime, however... The monument we know as Ireland's Stonehenge has come back from the dead, so to speak, thanks to the magic of 3D computer modelling. A Turkish 3D design artist, Kerem Gogus, has recreated a vision of Ireland's Stonehenge based upon Wright's 18th century drawing and one of Kerem's 3D renderings of Ireland's Stonehenge, as I mentioned earlier on, is the background, the feature uh, image in tonight's graphic for the episode. 
uh, for this episode. Gogress's work presents to us the first really exciting visual insight into this fascinating monument in a way that Wright's two-dimensional drawing could never do. The computer modeling allows the monument to be shown in different lighting and weather environments. And because of this, we are afforded a dramatic and somewhat poignant look at something unique in terms of monumental architecture and scale that was foolishly and tragically torn apart. I, I, you may not be able to hear that, or maybe you can, but uh, sk sk squeaky toy, Coda has found the squeaky toy. And does he like squeaking that squeaky toy? <laughs> we may never see the monument restored to its former glory, but I hold firm to the hope that it might, in time, be at least partially restored. And with enough will and a little bit of imagination, perhaps someone in the locality of Carnbeg, Ballynahattan, will eventually build a full-scale replica of Ireland Stonehenge in the vicinity of the original site. Wouldn't that be an exciting prospect? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of Ireland Stonehenge in a nutshell. Uh, you should understand that a, a, a huge number of monuments were destroyed. This, What makes this one exceptionally unique, and I know unique means it's a one of a kind, so there's no grades of unique. It's either unique or it's not, but is, this is exceptionally unique. The first thing is its design, right? So if you look at Wright's drawing, you will see... Uh, a stone circle and another stone circle. So we immediately have two concentric stone circles. That's unusual. Outside of that, we have a giant embanked enclosure, which is undoubtedly what we call uh, an embanked henge, a henge slash embanked enclosure, probably, probably dating from the late Neolithic, probably four and a half thousand years old, at least, if not a little bit more. Outside of that is a, a giant ring of standing stones that appear to resemble those that encircle uh, uh, Newgrange. Noel Grant Matthews is in the house. Hello, Noel. Long time no see. Hope yourself and Mark and all the family are keeping well. Um, so this is in highly unusual. And if you look at it a little bit closer in detail, you'll find that, in fact, on the top of the embankment, there seems to be part of a circle of stones. So four circles in total. Uh, one, two, the huge enclosure with the stones on top of it, and then the giant ring of stones outside. Yes, Yvette says, you suggested you might show the picture in Island of the Seven Stones. It's all right, Sassia, you don't have to do it. Yet. You're perfectly okay to sit there. Don't worry. And I know you don't want to go out there because you'll only be assaulted by Coda. Coda doesn't uh, play with Saskia. He assaults her. <laughs> I'm not joking, by the way. He actually did hurt her one day because he jumped on her and she just didn't like it at all. Now, the giant rings. Can I find it? This is all stuff I have on my hard drive, by the way, that I can share uh, on the page and the community later. Uh, in fact, the photo is, to is so small here as to render it uh, not really visible. But this is the, this is the, the, the crop mark image from Cambridge. Uh, from 1970 that Victor Buckley said oh yeah that looks like it might be the outline of this famous uh, missing monument uh, of of um, of rights the other thing that makes it unique profoundly unique is that how often do we have a case where a monument is destroyed now but we have some idea what it looked like before it was destroyed because a drawing of it was made in 1748. Now, remember, Wright and Lord Limerick and the Coulters, uh, they, they, were all, uh, they were all British. They were, uh, you know, not Irish speakers. Uh, they probably had no regard for the traditions of the time. It, 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 it appears from my sort of reading of Wright's material, that he didn't consult the locals in the way that, for instance, the later Ordnance Survey did, uh, like John O'Donovan in the 1830s, etc., you know, and actually ask people, what is the tradition about this monument? What do people say about it? What was its name? What is, And that is one aspect of it that we've lost. We've lost any of the traditions associated with it, uh, or we've, we may not have. As we saw about Fornox, we thought we'd lost everything there. Squeaky McSqueak. He's doing that to he's just doing that to wind me up now. Um 
you know, and um, what, what was I talking about? Uh, Lohar Alva in relation to Fornox. And that maybe Hicks is entirely right in his proposal that uh, Enoch Arby Rofer is the name given to the complex in which Ireland Stonehenge was once located. So there are the two things that make it unique. The first of all, there is nothing else like it in the archaeological record. Nothing like it with, with basically four concentric circles. Two stone circles, a giant embanked enclosure, and a giant ring of stones. I'm going to see if I can get it off. <laughs> it's funny, when I, when I got to the door, <laughs> he dropped it. <laughs> and now he's 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 back trying to get it again. Um, yeah. First of all, is its design, and second of all, is the fact that we have a drawing of it, and we know what it looked like. You know. So comparisons with Dronehenge. How it compares with Dronehenge is it's similar in size. It's likely to have been constructed in the same period. It was likely to have been part of a complex of monuments. Um. <sighs> It's roughly circular, you know. Where it differs is that Dronehenge, we think, was almost entirely made of timber. And because all of that timber has rotted away, there's basically nothing left except for the holes into which the timbers were inserted and those segmented ditch sections, uh, which were probably dug out. So if you dug the ground at Newgrange Farm, uh, let's speculate that it was possible to do a, a, a large-scale uh, dig on drone hinge starting tomorrow you wouldn't find any stones bar those that were dropped by the glaciers the, the gravel and the alluvial stones that are, that are there you wouldn't find any structure as such you would be you would be digging down into brighter and darker areas of soil the darker areas representing the post holes that have been since filled in however if you did an archaeological dig at ireland stonehenge well, first of all, you, you're probably going to find the sockets for the inner circles of stones. They're the ones, the smaller ones were likely to have been the ones that were broken up to be used as uh, material for the foundation of the road and also for gate posts. You would probably find uh, ev lots of evidence of the embankment, the giant embankment of Ireland Stonehenge. Um, so if you, if you didn't just find the denuded banks, you would probably find the gravel of it as well. Now, we know that from the Boyne Henges, uh, from the drought imagery in 2018, that, for instance, Site P, which is next to Drone Henge, uh, its bank was likely to have had lots of stone in it because it, it showed uh, a negative uh, uh, crop mark, a very faded, bleached crop mark, which indicates that there's probably lots of stone beneath the soil there. And, of course, further, for, further to that, and most exciting and tantalizing is the possibility that you would find at least a number of those really large uh, megaliths, the large standing stones around Ireland Stonehenge, because the evidence suggests that they were actually just dropped into large holes in the ground behind them uh, in order to avoid the plow. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, stone monuments are lovely to look at, uh, but uh, for the expedience of uh, agriculture and, uh, you know, uh, the growing of food and perhaps the profit uh, from the same, uh, it was better for these things to be uh, put into holes in the ground. Of course, I'm not defending that. I think it's awful what happened to Ireland Stonehenge, uh, such a unique monument. And there may, be, there may be nothing else like it, not just in Ireland. In fact, there may be nothing else like it in the rest of Europe. We'd be hard pressed to find anything. Uh, along that scale. Aaron wants to know what size it was. Um, let me just see if, if I wrote about the estimate of the size of it yet. That's a very good question. Like in diameter, the hinges of the Boyne are about 150 meters, which is about 500 feet. Um, but it, but, it, but it just seeing if uh, Ireland's, if there was any ever any indication as to what size it might have been.
No, I don't immediately see it, but I'll tell you what, I can estimate it because I, I, I know the rough dimensions of it just from looking at Google Earth. So I'm zooming in on Google Earth here and I'm going to find the location of it just off the Armagh Road. Just look for the golf course beyond the railway line. Let me just uh, sort of give a, a rough, uh, where's the ruler tool here? Sorry, it's in behind where the camera is. There we go. Let me have a measure here and just give me just give me a rough idea of what we're talking about in terms of in terms of width. Yeah, I mean, roughly 130, 140, 150 meters in diameter. So we're looking at something along the same uh, scale as uh, drone hinge. Paul Blockley says the Neolithic tombs, the Irish Neolithic tombs are also very early in date. Well, the earliest of the megalithic tombs are in Sligo and they're up to 3,800 BC. The Brunabonia sites are much closer to 3,000 BC. They're about 31, 32, 3,300 BC. Uh, and the other very interesting thing uh, in the description of uh, Ireland Stonehenge as being you know, a place for astronomical observations is the comment that there's a range of mountains to the north, you know, that you can see the, the Fuse Mountains and uh, Schlieve Gullion to the northwest and then the Cooley Mountains. Like the whole northern horizon is basically mountains. And that's very important because we know that uh, notches in mountains and peaks in mountains were used, um, you know, as sort of ranging sites. Uh, or ranging features uh, to mark certain significant sunrises, moonrises, sunsets, moonsets, star risings, star settings. And so that is likely to have been an important, uh, 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 you know, function. Function. The mountains are natural features. Uh, but that is something that would have, I think, probably helped in terms of the decision to locate it there, you know. Now, it is part of a wider complex because about... Um, Again, I need to measure uh, somewhat to the west of Karen Beg, uh, just where the modern M1 uh, crosses the river there, uh, almost a kilometre and a half west, was, was what Wright described as a Druid's Grove with a number of sites. And they're all destroyed. They're all gone. Uh, they were all levelled. And then, of course, um, uh, uh, the one that was mentioned earlier on by a commenter, uh, Knuck Cain McConche, who is supposed to have been the father of Lou, uh, that there was probably a megalithic tomb, at least one on the top of that hill, but that was quarried out of it uh, by a local, uh, should we say, industrialist, somebody who had several lime kilns uh, and was fetching limestone from uh, the various uh, hills in the area. Uh, and there was little or no concern uh, for monuments that had stood for generations hundreds of years perhaps thousands of years were were basically almost wiped off the face of the earth uh, somewhat to the northwest or north of uh the site of ireland stonehenge in 2018 matthew kelly who's a friend of mine and a drone pilot discovered what is likely to be a a, a large cluster or complex of Bronze Age barrows to the north. I think they were in the townland of Carn Moor, and he also found st structures in Sportsman's Hall, etc., in that sort of area. Um, and so we know that there was a serious amount of activity in this area in uh, pre-Christian, in prehistoric times. Uh, as I say, the unfortunate thing is, while there was a fairly substantial complex of monuments at Brunabonia, a great deal of those have survived. Those that haven't survived uh, may yet come back to life in the case of Dronehenge and the timber structures that, that wouldn't have survived anyway. Um, there isn't much else that was completely destroyed. Uh, Kletchuk is the big one, of course. Kletchuk, which Elizabeth Hickey uh, said is, is undoubtedly at Rossnery, and I think actually my own feeling about it is that Rossnery was either built on it or built on its remains, or that uh, a bit like Douth Hall, which was built on a passage tomb there, that uh, perhaps Kletchuk, uh, the stones of Kletchuk were used in the building of uh, Rossnery House. That's something we may not know. Uh, it's something that 
archaeologists may be able to determine down the line. What differs, though, with the complexes outside Dundalk is that there was kind of wholesale destruction. And whatever about a timber henge, like drone henge, that was never going to survive uh, because this, the timber would need to be replenished on a generational basis. A large multi-circled or concentric circled uh, henge monument, uh, and a very unique one by the sounds of it, such as Ireland Stone Henge, uh, is inco incomparable. Uh, there's nothing else in the record uh, to compare to it. Not that I am aware of, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm not sure if any of the archaeologists would contest that one. I don't think they would, to be honest. It, it was uh, truly awesome. It must have been an awesome sight to behold. How it differs from England Stonehenge is that uh, the stones of England Stonehenge seem to be, quite a few of them are larger, apart from the, the, the ones at Ireland Stonehenge appear to have been used. Uh, they were natural boulders that were just put into place. They weren't worked into shape. They weren't sort of very straight edged by the looks of Wright's drawing. And of course, we only have Wright's drawing to go on. Uh, so we don't know otherwise. Uh, and the stone circles in the interior are, were very small. And also, it doesn't seem to have been the case. It seems to be, or sorry, it doesn't seem to have been the case that there are any lintels, hanging lintels, which is where, of course, the name henge comes from, hanging lintels, those crossbar stones across the top of the standing stones. Uh, one of the things that could be done easily is the employment, as um, Ronald Hicks suggests, of ground penetrating radar of or magnetometry, uh, further uh, geophysical tests or surveys of the land in question to see indeed if perhaps uh, some of those large uh, megaliths or those monoliths, as I call them, are still beneath the ground there. Uh, and then, of course, after that, an archaeological dig. Uh, and who knows what might be found, you know? I mean, yeah, as I say, it is, it's gone, but it may not be gone, as it were. And, of course, lots of monuments that were seriously damaged by ploughing and agricultural activity still have a substantial presence beneath the, the plough soil or the plough zone, you know? And it, it might be also, um, you know, possible that this monument could be included in a future sort of advanced program of archaeological research. Like that if you were to pick out uh, monuments uh, that basically have no uh, physical or visual presence on the ground um, for uh, prospection uh, and remote sensing and, you know, to like archaeology is an evolving science and even O'Kelly, Professor O'Kelly who excavated Newgrange knew that and that's the reason he, he left so much of the monument to be excavated in the future that Ireland's Stonehenge and Dronehenge, there's two, two monuments immediately that have no surface expression that they could be included in some sort of advanced archaeological program uh, which might not require uh, the digging of the ground, now of course there is nothing that beats that because out of the ground you can retrieve stone tools and implements and finds, and of course, bones and other organic material that can tell you about the people who live there, that can tell you a bit about their diet and the animals that they had if they farmed, and the grains that they farmed and what foods they might have eaten, and of course, datable material for carbon dating, which might give us an age. But I suspect this one is a late Neolithic structure, uh, much like the henge, many of the other henges in Ireland. If it was a teaching school for astronomy, perhaps it could help understand the stone carvings in some way, says Jules Cousins. Yes, indeed. Uh, and of course, another interesting prospect is the fact that um, I have investigated alignments and it's something I must do a blog post on because I never published the work. Ireland Stonehenge is directly on a couple of significant alignments with other ancient sites. Uh, and as always, I consider these things to be less likely to be a coincidence where the sites in question are substantial sites, you know. Um, one of the standing monuments of the area that is still there uh, west of Dundalk is, of course, Castletown Moat, which is said to be the burial place 
uh, or sorry, the place where Cucullin lived, actually. Uh, and of course, Dun Jalagin, uh, uh, which gives its name to Dundalk. Uh, so that is one that still stands, uh, but unfortunately, many of the others are not there anymore. Monica says, on the European continent, most prehistoric or Celtic remains were destroyed through the Catholic Church. Well, uh, that 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 is not the case in Ireland. Uh, the church didn't destroy sites in Ireland. In fact, what the church tended to do was to try and Christianize a site by building a church beside it, sometimes on top of it. Uh, so that is definitely not the case in Ireland. A great deal of the destruction, actually, of, of prehistoric sites in Ireland has taken place in the last two decades, and a great deal of it has been the result of agricultural activity. Um, now, of course, the Normans refashioned a lot of old burial mounds into castle, castle moats. Uh, they used what was there and they reinforced it. Uh, but I don't think, in the case of Ireland, I don't think it's true that the, that the church destroyed uh, monuments. Uh, and there's lots to be said about the church. And we had a discussion one night, uh, and I didn't like the direction it was going in because it was very anti-church. And it's not that I'm pro-church, uh, but it's just we, we, it got into church bashing. But uh, I'd like to have a discussion about that sometime. Uh, show me the evidence that the church destroyed Irish sites. What the church did was suppressed all uh, uh, all of the uh, the pagan beliefs, but it certainly didn't destroy any of the sites. It repurposed them, actually. So, for instance, Croke and Igla became Croke Patrick, you know. Doa Slánia, the burial mound of Slánia, the fur bull king, became the place where Patrick lit the Paschal fire, etc., etc. They Christianized them. They certainly didn't destroy them. Not in the physical sense, anyway. Sorry I missed some of this episode. Did you say how old Ireland Stonehenge is? Is it older than England Stonehenge? We don't know, Mary, and that's because we have no archaeological evidence per se. It would have to be dug and we'd have to find dateable evidence. If it is a henge and it looks like, very much like it was a henge, it looks like it would be dated to the late Neolithic period, which would put it somewhere approximately between 2500 BC and 2800 BCE, uh, that sort of time period. But we can we can't know without uh, that evidence. Rory wants to know which monument is considered Ireland Stonehenge. Yeah, maybe it would be easier, Rory, if you could watch from the beginning. The monument is uh, outside Dundalk, uh, uh, and it was detailed by uh, Thomas Wright in 1748. But as soon as this video is finished, it'll be available to watch on Facebook, and also I'll upload, uh, or the the YouTube version will also be immediately available. Uh, so uh, there's no point in me answering that question because I'll just be repeating exactly what I've been saying for the whole episode Porig says its location on the northern bank of the Castletown River is of huge significance especially with the significant bend the river takes at this point that's a very interesting point, Porig. Yeah. It's still a little bit further away from the river, though, than, you know, what is, let's, let's just give a rough. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, it's actually, it's not. It's only, uh, it's only half a kilometer away from the, from the bend in the river there. Yeah, it's interesting, though, isn't it? And I, I just, uh, so just as, again, folks, I'm not getting into the church bashing discussion. I'm not doing it. Okay. So uh, I'm not going there. There's, there's some of us who just need to agree to disagree uh, on our opinions about what the church did and didn't do. But in terms of the physical destruction of monuments, the church did not physically destroy monuments. It just didn't. And if you can give me the examples, I'll gladly have a look at them. What is the latitude, longitude location of Ireland Stonehenge? Teresa wants to know. Okay, well, roughly, we'll, we'll put a pin in the center of it here in uh, Google Maps, and I'll give you the location. So just uh, if you want to take this down, uh, Teresa, 54 degrees, 1 minute, 44 seconds north, 6 degrees, 24 arc minutes, 
41 arc seconds west. 51 zero, 01 44 north. 6 24 41 west. I hope that helps. Mary Hanrahan says, I love your episodes. Thank you for the research and discussion. Very glad to share it, Mary, and I'm glad you're enjoying it. Kelly Edmiston, you're a star. <laughs> it's great to see you again, by the way. And it's lovely to, for you to join in our live uh, uh, Irish Myths episodes. Thanks, Ralph. You're very, very welcome. Okay, that appears to be it. So I'm just going to check YouTube. No destruction. Mingling, maybe, says d -Lin. Yes, maybe, indeed. It's a mingling. What are the chances of a dig, asks Joan. <sighs> to be honest, before COVID, low. In the aftermath of COVID, I reckon money for archaeology will be impossible to find. So I think in the future, we're going to have to find new methods of looking under the ground. Calvin Clown say, said, I know there's cases of stone circles being made into passage tombs. Do you think the circle at Newgrange could have become Newgrange? No. In fact, the stone circle at Newgrange, Calvin, is uh, up to a millennium younger than the great monument it encircles. It, it is actually younger. Uh, those stones were put in later. I'm just looking if anyone else. Demo Ward, there was a talk of the owner. Yeah, well, the, unfortunately, there'll be no there'll be no money for development of any kind uh, for the next while anyway. So there'll be neither building taking place on that land nor archaeology archaeology on it uh, in the meantime. I'm going to restart to get the beginning, says Mez Marion. That's a good idea, especially if you've missed the beginning. No problem. Have we discussed Sheila and a gig in earlier episodes? No, we didn't, Debbie. Not to any particular extent, I don't think. Um, and that's one that we could put down. If it isn't down already, it may actually be down on the list of suggestions. No, it's not. So there you go. Yeah. I know we did a little bit of reading um, from one of Jack Roberts's books. Sorry, who was it suggested that? Could anybody who needs to go, don't worry, head off. Go fund me, dig. <laughs> That's a suggestion. Debbie Daly. Thanks for the suggestion, Daly. Debbie, even. Um, who is suggesting a go fund me, dig? Paul Nolan. Yeah. Could you imagine how much it would cost, though? You know, like the the money is 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 quite serious. You know. Anyway. Uh, it's an hour and a half nearly. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Any more questions, don't forget. Always try to interact on the Mythical Ireland community group. Uh, this is the Mythical Ireland page. Mythical Ireland community is uh, a separate group, and I'm just going to paste a link to that as a comment uh, on YouTube and on the Facebook. Uh, so um, head on over there uh, and join if you haven't joined already. And uh, Sorry, I'm trying to remember what I'm trying to do here. Uh, and share if you have uh, pictures. Somebody said they have pictures of Douth Hall uh, dig, and I will share pictures uh, from my hard drive of various aspects of Ireland's Stonehenge so you can get another look at it. In the meantime, everybody, stay safe, stay well, keep up your social distancing, cover your faces if you're going outside. Most importantly, keep washing your hands as often as you possibly can. We want everybody to stay safe and stay, stay well so that you can keep coming back tomorrow. Episode 72, don't forget, Friday night episode is one hour earlier than uh, every other night, so 7 p.m. Irish time. So take an hour off whatever time you started tonight, and we'll come back to it again tomorrow night. In the meantime, call us off, August Long, a full, have a safe sleep, and bye for now. We'll see you all tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.